Hi there, I'm Wazza and you're watching Bike File, the show that brings you all the information you need about the best bikes on the market. Each week we'll be looking at a different category of bikes and this week it's the turn of bikes from Germany, a small and select band of fine thoroughbred machines, which unsurprisingly is why we're here in a BMW showroom. In this week's show I'll be looking at BMW's R1150R Rockster plus their R1150 GS Wonder Trail Bike. Also I'll be checking out the MZ Scorpion Sport. Meanwhile, Louise will be riding Saxe's Roadster 650 and Rod will be on BMW's Oddball C1. And now, just to prove that not all German bikes come from the same manufacturer, here we have one from MZ. Now, if you're familiar with MZ, it could probably be for those very basic, really cheap single cylinder two strokes that they turned out for years from East Germany. These were the Trabants of the bike world and almost classics in a funny, quirky sort of way. But that's not all MZ have ever made. After all, remember, this is the factory that back in the 40s and 50s pretty much can be credited with inventing the performance two-stroke. So they've got a few surprises up their sleeve, and this Scorpion Sport is just such a bike. It's a bit sporty, it's got a bit of handling, it's got a bit of character, but ultimately, it's still what MZ do best. It's a cheap and cheerful motorcycle. So let's see what it's all about. Well, that motor there comes all the way from the land of the rising sun as it's the next to unburstable 660cc single cylinder affair that powered Yamaha's legendary XT660 trail bike. Hardly the most obvious engine to put at the heart of a supposed sports machine, but then the Scorpion isn't really all about breaking lap records and setting the world on fire. Look at it as a brisk, fun bike that won't break the bank and you're much nearer the mark. And seen this way, the motor's 50 odd horsepower are more than enough to hop it past the 100 mile an hour mark, should you feel spirited. There are some vibes to be dealt with, however, which will either endear the bike to you straight away if you're a big singles fan, or they'll put you off just as quickly. Much like the ill-fated SZR660 that Yamaha themselves made using the XT motor, the MZ is a decent little handler. And unlike the aforementioned SZR, it is not a hideous blot on the face of motorcycling, but actually quite a decent little package. What you've got here is a surprisingly taut chassis, and even though those forks up at the front are really rather basic and not adjustable at all, and the rear shock is again very basic, although you do get the option of preload adjustment, you've got a package that hangs together very nicely. And because the motor is not the most powerful thing in the world, you can gladly thrash this bike to its limits, safe in the knowledge that the chassis is always going to keep you out of trouble. All this makes for quite a lot of fun. But the downside is, like I said, it is a slow motorcycle. And ultimately, any 400cc grey import will see it for dead in any back-to-back -back straight line contest. Styling-wise, the world got a bit excited when the Scorpion arrived, and it even picked up a couple of vaguely prestigious design awards here and there. But looking at it now, it's hard to see why. That said, the looks are still easy enough on the eye, and even pleasingly sleek on occasion, so there's no need to worry about being laughed out of your local pub car park either. As for the rest of the bike, workmanlike is the way to describe it. You get clocks that tell you how fast you're going, brakes that slow you down just about well enough for the speeds you'll muster from the bike, and even a small fairing to keep off the worst of the wind. The MZ Scorpion Sport is a no-frills motorcycle, but it's a good one. There's a little bit of power to play with, there's more handling than you'd actually expect, and as a first motorcycle, or an everyday hack to use to save your pride and joy getting a real pasting, this is a serious bargain that's well worth hunting out if you can find one. Anyway, now it's time for the scores. Performance, six out of 10. Just on the right side of very, very flat. Comfort, 7 out of 10. Plenty of space, no major gripes, and that fairing doesn't do a bad job for the speed you're going to get from the bike. Street cred, 5 out of 10. Not so bad in that red and yellow, but the MZ tag is always going to carry a stigma in certain circles. Reliability, 8 out of 10. That motor is understressed and next to unburstable. To be honest, I can't see any major problems on the horizon owning one of these. Value for money, 9 out of 10. Will go on forever, won't cost very much, and should almost put a smile on your face every now and again too. Well, that's it for the Scorpion Sport, and shortly I'm going to be testing this here Rockster. But before we do that, it's time for Louise and her weekly road test. Cheers, was it? Now, if I said to you at home, fizzy drink, you'd probably think cola. If I asked you to draw me a picture of a pet dog, you'd probably create a beautiful image of a friendly golden animal with four legs and a tail. 
Now, if I said to you that this bike, the Saks 650 Roadster, is a machine that most people would picture if you'd simply say motorbike, then you'd probably agree. It has a certain classical retro charm about it, and that oldie worldy look is met in the middle by a combination of German and Japanese engineering. In short, it's simply one of those user-friendly motorbikes that doesn't put a foot wrong. Manufactured in Germany, the 650 Roadster benefits from a Suzuki 650cc single-cylinder power plant, delivering a learner-friendly 33 brake horsepower. You see, there's no protection from the elements, there's no screen and there's no fairing, so this bike is strictly limited to tootling around town, with maybe a few B-roads thrown in for good measure. You really wouldn't want to be flying down the motorway at 70 mile an hour on this now, would you? Around town the bike forms very well, allowing you to take advantage of the torquey bottom end of the rev range. You'll never feel like you have to really work the motor, thus leaving you with less gear changes to make. But gear changes on this bike are rather a pleasant experience. They in themselves are effortless and you can swap cogs very smoothly without the severe clunkiness often associated with single cylinder motors. Stopping shouldn't be a problem with that rather impressive 320mm disc up front complete with fork pot caliper. At the rear you'll find a single potter with a 220mm disc and that should be just about enough to slow this baby down should one of those Volvo estates rear its ugly head from the local junction. Considering the bike's weight, fueled up and ready to go, stands at 169 kilos. We have a bike that's not heavy, but then again it's not light. It's not particularly fast, but it's not slow either. What we do have, though, is a bike that's not bad, but it's not great. Now, throw this in with German build quality and Japanese reliability, but you do have a fairly safe purchase. So, we can conclude that the bike's performance is adequate. But looking at it, it's aesthetically pleasing and it's well proportioned. We can only describe it as honest and timeless. But how does it measure up with our bike fire scores on the doors? Let's take a look, shall we? Performance, the Roadster earns itself 7 out of 10. It doesn't pretend to be a rocket ship, but handles surprisingly well. Comfort is where the Roadster scores another 7. The riding position is well thought out. The seat itself is forgiving, whilst the reach to the handlebars means even the shorter riders out there can comfortably reach the grips. The Roadster scores high on build quality with a 9 out of 10. The sax has been put together with superb attention to detail. It feels solid and safe, as only you'd expect from the Germans. But how does the bike affect your pocket? Well, you see, these bikes aren't produced in large numbers, and considering the quality of the craftsmanship, 4295 on the road isn't expensive. However, there are a few Japanese alternatives that are a little bit cheaper, but not much, so the bike scores 7 out of 10. And last but not least, street cred, the Roadster earns itself an 8 out of 10, surprisingly. You see, it scores rather well here because it has classical good looks and a dollop of chrome that make it rather appealing. That's your lot from me and the sax. It's now back to Wazza with more Big Boys toys. Thanks, Louise. Well, earlier in the show, I had a look at MZ Scorpion Sport, a nice, cheap and cheerful German motorcycle. But now it's time for something more expensive, more powerful and altogether more versatile. It's BMW's R1150 GS. This bike is a true modern classic and the biggest crossover model BMW have yet made because this is capable of slapping grins onto the faces of your most die-hard sports bike nut while at the same time appealing to BMW's more traditional touring and matching leathers brigade. As well as this confidence the bike instills, you also get a feeling of serious capability which starts with that well-equipped cockpit that tells you everything you need to know in remarkable clarity the heated grips that take the chill out of those early morning starts and the adjustable screen that will see you right to a comfortable 110 mile an hour. All this means as soon as you slide into the GS's thickly padded perch you come over all adventurous. Even if you just pop into the shops for a loaf of bread, it's always nice to feel you're on a bike that could just as easily whisk you to Morocco in a couple of days ride should you fancy it. Power isn't the GS's strong point with a modest 85 brake horse at the back wheel but don't get the impression this bike is any slug. With a strong and healthy low down punch, it'll happily rear up onto the back wheel off the throttle in first gear, while a sniffer clutch has it doing just the same in second. This hit gets the GS off the line very quickly, 
but you'll need to be quick with that gear lever to keep this progress going. As with most BMWs, feedback isn't something you get by the tonne, but there's a certain confidence this bike gives you which means you kind of know how hard to push anyway. All this means that if you want to boogie on the GS, you can really play hard, and chucking something this big about is always going to be satisfying. Styling, 7 out of 10. It's unique, despite being a little bit ugly. Performance, 8 out of 10. Bikes this big should not be this much fun. Comfort, 9 out of 10. Excellent, although the pillion could be better. Reliability, 9 out of 10. This bike will probably last happily into the next millennium. Value for money, 9 out of 10. Not the cheapest thing to buy, but could simply be the only bike you'll ever need, and it will last. So now we've been out on the Scorpion Sport and the R1150 GS, and out of the two of them, I'd have to go for the R1150 any day of the week, because it is still one of the best all-round motorcycles ever made. Anyway, that's it for part one, but do join us again in part two, when Louise will have our buying guide for German motorcycles, Rod will be playing with the funky little C1 and I'll be finishing off our three bike road test. See you then. Hi there and welcome back to part two of Bike File with me, Wazza. Now, later in this show, I'm going to be checking out this here Rockster and we'll have the results of our three bike test. But before that, it's time for Rod Gibson and his weekly road test. Now, when the producer told me I was going to be riding a race replica today, I didn't quite know what to expect, but it certainly wasn't one of these. This is a BMW C1. Not quite a scooter, not quite a motorcycle, but what BMW call an innovative mobility concept. And if you're wondering about the colour scheme, it's because this bike was the personal paddock transport for Gus Scott in last year's Boxer Cup. Now, this is going to be interesting. The idea of sitting upright in a bike with a roof is not a new one. British designer Malcolm Newell cut a swathe through conventional motorcycle thinking with his Quasar in the mid-70s. Unfortunately, he didn't live to see the concept picked up by BMW, who have scaled down the engine size and tailored the design to aim at the city commuter market. The roof conceals a built-in framework which is immensely stiff, and a seatbelt keeps a rider safe and secure in the event of a spill. Full weather protection is of course a huge advantage, and BMW fondly imagine hordes of young professionals buzzing around between meetings in all the major European cities. With full weather protection and a roof, you won't be needing this, or these, or these, and you shouldn't be needing one of these. But despite BMW's assertions that the C1 is as safe to drive as a small car, there's still one country in Europe that insists you wear a crash helmet to ride it. And that country is right here in the UK. The little BMW is quite fun to ride despite its limited size and performance. And even I can fit in it. I wouldn't like to attempt a long distance journey in one, but hey, that's not what it was designed for. As a city commuter, this is a brilliant traffic buster and with congestion charging threatening to spread from London to the other big cities, one of these could be a really smart buy. You really can't knock BMW for trying something new, and I quite like this little C1. Innovative mobility concept or no, you can see how it all makes sense, and maybe in a parallel universe we'll all be using these things to ride to work in a few years' time. It certainly makes a lot more sense than the morning traffic jam, and it's a lot more fun. Let's put it on the list of good ideas and hope that it catches on. And now, for some scores. For performance, I have to say it's low in power and high in weight compared to a conventional bike. But the C1 isn't about speed, and judged on its own terms, it works well. If you accept the design brief was to beat city traffic, it succeeds brilliantly. And on those terms, I'm going to rate it at 9 out of 10 for performance. But if you want rip-snorting power, it's back out into the rain for you. Comfort now, and if you can imagine riding a bike that keeps you dry when it rains, has a riding position like an armchair, and even comes with a windscreen wiper and a stereo, you can see why this C1 has to score highly for comfort. It doesn't have the heater of Malcolm Newell's original Quasar, but it's light years more practical than any conventional scooter. And for that, I could even live with the odd looks of the thing. 9 out of 10 for comfort. Reliability should not be a problem either. This C1 comes from one of the world's acknowledged leaders in vehicle engineering, and both BMW's bikes and cars have an enviable reputation for quality. 
buy a C1 and you get the full BMW after sales package, including an extensive warranty. I can think of no reason to give it anything lower than an 8 for reliability. Street cred, however, is a rather different matter. It might make lots of sense, but the C1 is an odd looking thing and looks like a cartoon contraption from some angles. The BMW badge will help stem some of the sniggers, but the C1 really needs to develop its image as a smart fashion accessory before it ends up going the same way as its Sinclair namesake, the C5. For the time being, 2 out of 10 for street cred, and fingers crossed that it catches on, for it really does deserve to succeed. And now, from one strange looking thing to another, here's water! Well, if this lot's wetting your appetite for German motorcycles, fear not, because here's Louise with our guide to buying German. The Germans have never been known for their sense of humour, but when it comes to their motorcycles, the stylists certainly do have a sense of humour, and a very strange one at that. OK, so they're not known for their looks, but German reliability is renowned worldwide. The Italians could learn a lot from them. Very practical. Um... Very well thought out, um, very well engineered as well, um, and capable of very, very high mileage. As I've mentioned, BMWs do have questionable looks, but some of the more touring biased machines do look more conventional. Then there's the BMW Cruiser that caught the eye of 007, so perhaps BMW are starting to toe the line a little. So are they the all-singing and all-dancing machines that we expect? I would say they make a, a, a super um, touring machine. They quite often got quite a good, quite good weather protection, um, and obviously, the, I mean, the police use them quite a lot. So that that sort of gives them a sort of seal of approval, doesn't it, for long, for for, for sort of high mileages and and, uh, and touring. And I would think that brilliant from that point of view. These are probably the most practical bikes on earth. BMW are known for their sound engineering and due to that these bikes do everything well and have lots of useful gadgets that BMW owners could never live without. Adjustable seat height, heated grips, hazard warning lights, the list is endless. These bikes are built for all day comfort and lots of miles. Numbum syndrome shouldn't be something to worry about on one of these masterpieces but do you really want one? They are a premium product. Um I mean, do cost more than the, the comparable um, Japanese machinery. Um, however, the second-hand value um, is much, much higher, so the cost of ownership should actually sink. Another thing which is very important with most German machinery um, is you'll never see them discounted. Uh, often with um, Japanese machinery, um, they're sold at the start of the season um, at full manufacturer's list, um, and then, perhaps six, seven months later, they're advertised about the £2,000 off. Once you've owned a Beamer, you won't think twice about buying another. Most BMW customers get hooked on the brand that is. They are BMW men until their dying day. There are a number of things that BMW motorcycles are renowned for, and these include having very complicated switch gear until you get used to it, rocking alarmingly to one side at a standstill thanks to the shaft drive spinning, and also being really rather dull. Much like the Germans themselves, BMW motorcycles are often perceived as being very efficient very practical, but really lacking in any great spark of life or originality. And while BMW refuse to bow to convention and continue to make motorcycles that are uniquely their own, they are working their freshly pressed German socks off to try and make some motorcycles that will actually attract people because they've got some life to them. And this is where we come to the Rockster here. What it actually is, is an R1150R, dressed up a bit and with a snazzier name. But as we'll see, that's not actually a bad thing at all. You see, the R1150R is one of motorcycling's great secrets because as far as pure and basic riding experiences go, it is an absolute belter. It's not the fastest bike around and nor is it the sharpest either, but for plain old fashioned riding about, as long as you don't feel any real need to top 100 mile an hour, it is about as good as it gets. And riding one, you soon start to feel smugly pleased with yourself that you've discovered this two wheeled utopia while everyone else around you continues in blissful ignorance. The 1150cc opposed twin boxer motor inside the Rockster is also an absolute joy to play with. Now granted it may not be the outright fastest motor around, but this is one seriously hefty piece of metalwork here that produces stacks of low down torque and especially with the optional extra race can and chip as fitted to this bike, 
there is more than enough stomp on tap off the bottom end of the dial to see off plenty of sports bikes from the lights should you catch them napping. Once you've prodded through the gearbox, top speed is realistically around about the 100 mile an hour mark, comes up very quickly. You can go on to about 120 should you feel like it, but without a fairing, it's really not very funny. As with all of BMW's big bikes, the Rockster does run their telelever front suspension system, which isolates the braking and suspension forces. The strange bit about this is you don't really get any fork dive on the brakes, but the plus side is a very planted front end that soaks up anything you can throw at it within the constraints of the motor's abilities. Also, on the Rockster, as opposed to the R1150R, you now get the front end off their sportier R1150S. So the question has to be, are BMW onto a winner with the Rockster? And I would say the answer to that question is yes. Because although this motorcycle will never be quite as mad as something like Aprilia's Tuono or Triumph Speed Triple, what BMW have here is a very nicely tweaked version of an already excellent motorcycle that has got plenty of attitude. Now, if you're spending just over seven grand on a bike, you're going to have a lot to choose from. But if you want an everyday machine that's still got plenty of bite and will last forever, then the Rockster could be very well worth having a look at. So let's see how it stacks up in the final scores. Styling, eight out of 10. This bike is seriously cool. Performance, seven out of 10. Maybe bumping up to an eight once you add on the race can and extra chip for a bit more oomph. Comfort. 7 out of 10. Very good every day riding about, but the only gripe I've got is those bars which do go a little too far forwards and could be a bit tricky should you want to go for a bit of distance. Reliability. 9 out of 10. It's a BMW, it will go on forever. Value for money. 7 out of 10. Not the cheapest bike around, but like I said, it will last a very long time and I'm pretty certain you're going to enjoy it. Well, that's it for this episode on German motorcycles. So it's time to pack away your lederhosen and swap them instead for your race leathers because next week we're dealing with serious sports bikes. We've got the ZX12, the new CBR600 and the GSXR1000 to name but a few. So we'll see you then.